So, Father, we thank you for tonight, Lord Jesus. We just thank you, Father, for what you're going to do in and through us tonight, Lord God. We thank you for the rainbow word spoken tonight, God. That's going to be power in each one's hearts here, God. We thank you for an impartation, Lord, that's going to be released through this message, Lord God. Just an impartation from you, Lord God, that eyes will open in our hearts to be able to see you, Lord, that, that there'll be a thirst and a hunger, Lord, in Jesus' name. For those that are hungry and thirsty here tonight, you will have an encounter with God here tonight. I don't know what it's going to look like, but you're going to just, he's going to manifest himself. So just be open and aware of what he's doing in and through this room. Tonight's your night, God. We just thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. For your glory, God, that's going to be poured out in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord God, for miracles during the message, miracles during the worship tonight, God, that took place. We thank you, Lord, that people are being healed in their souls and their bodies, God, in Jesus' name. I ask, Lord, that you pour out your loving uh, presence and power, the oil from heaven, God, that's healing broken hearts, Lord. This is the redemption story. I, I can't get it out of my mind that we've been redeemed for such a time as today, tonight, for this time that we all have a plan and a purpose that God has for us. Not to harm us, to give us a future and our hope, God. We just ask, Lord God, that, that the shackles are broken in Jesus' name, that people won't stay silent anymore, that they're gonna walk in boldness after tonight like they never walked before, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for revival, for revival, for revival, that people are, there's an awakening taking place here tonight. God, and there's been an awakening that, that's been happening at these revival meetings with all the testimonies coming forth that people are getting transformed by the glory. I'm going to talk about transformation tonight a little bit. And I, I'm just going to bring, the, bring a message that, that is going to take you from glory to glory. But you're in the message. You're in the, the, the story. The story that will take you to a more deep, intimate relationship with Jesus. So I thank you, Lord God, for your presence. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're coming, you're here, but you're coming in a more powerful way, a more tangible way. Lord, that you would touch people, Lord God. We're not afraid of the power of God in this place, in the mighty name of Jesus. Just manifest yourself, Holy Spirit, in a way that would touch each one individually, what they need to hear tonight, God. In Jesus' name, move in power, God. We ask that your gifts would be accelerated tonight, in the mighty name of Jesus accelerating your gifts, Lord, that we would be a, a fresh baptism of fire and love and acceleration tonight, that you would impart the gifts of the Spirit, Lord God, that maybe you never walked in before, but maybe after tonight or during the message, you'll have a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge for somebody here. At any waking moment, somebody can take this mic, mic from me if they have a word from God. So I thank you, Lord, that for the gift of discernment, the gift of healing, the gift of miracles, God, in Jesus' name. We just decree the gift of prophecy to come forth, that we will not be silent. We will stand up and go forth to advance the kingdom of God and push back the gates of hell, in Jesus' name. I decree an awakening and an impartation of hunger and thirst tonight. At the end of this message, when we do prayer, if you want an impartation from God, just come to the altar. I'm a human being, a vessel that's holding on to the Lord, that will lay hands on you, but it will be Jesus in you by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit that will decide what you get tonight. I just got to be faithful. When God says there's an impartation that's going to take place, that if God is touching you right now in the mighty name of Jesus, you know there's more for you. There's more in your ministry. There's more boldness coming forth in the mighty name of Jesus. He's accelerating you right now in the mighty name of Jesus. And we just call down fire from heaven right now. Fire, tongues of fire that would just touch this place, Lord God. In the mighty name of Jesus. That even as this message goes forth about the glory of God tonight, the purity of God, the glory of God, the fire of God, that people would be touched. Lord, that you would move in the hearts of each one here, God. Holy Spirit, come. Come, touch us, Lord. Touch us like in holiness tonight, God. That we would, we would see the true redemption story for ourselves. 
that you want us to be holy, Lord. You call us to be holy. Holy, Lord God. That your Holy Spirit that lives inside of us would just impart holiness as we surrender because we're desperate to know you, Lord. We're always part of the equation. You don't transform us from glory to glory without our participation. It comes as we shout to you through worship, as we enter in and cry out for more, as we have a desire to know you, Jesus. It just doesn't happen unless we are crying out for more, that we'd humble ourselves, fall to the ground and pray and seek your face and not play church, but have a real relationship with you, God. Every chain broken, True, true redemption is happening. True redemption. Our redemption story is all about you, Jesus. Your power. It's creation. All the way to revelation. You're just doing a full circle. And we're in the midst. From creation all the way to the book of Revelation when we're raptured, God. That we want to be transformed in your glory, God. In the Old Testament, in Isaiah, it says, No one will share my glory. But in John 17, Jesus is on his knees and crying out the last prayer before he went to the cross and in the garden. And he said, God, that, that we would have the same glory. That Jesus, that you poured out in Jesus, that you would pour the same glory out on us. If we surrender, that we want your glory that we want to move in the things of the kingdom of God and lay down and hate the things in this world. You said that we're an enemy of God. This is what the Bible says in James 3 and 1 John 2. That if we partake in the things of this world, God will reveal to each one of our hearts what that is. What's worldly, that's not of Him. We're not friends of the people in this world. We're crying out for salvation for our family, for our friends that don't know you because you've lifted the veil. The Bible says that we know that when he appears, it will be, we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. In 1 John 3, he says that he loves us so much. We're going to turn there. That's where we're going to start. 1 John 3. If you have your Bible or your phone and you want to go travel around with me tonight in the Word, we thank you, God, for your glory, for your purity, for your holiness, God, to be imparted tonight, that we would lay something down tonight that we've been holding on to in Jesus' name. 1 John. I'm here at John 17, and I go, ooh, I want to read there, but... <laughs> I love him so much. I want to read you the whole Bible tonight. <laughs> Are you guys up for it? <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. We're in his family, church. We're in his family. How much that he would... This is where he's relating to being a child of God. We know it says in Romans 8, 16 that we're a child of God, that we know by the Spirit of God that lives in us. We shouldn't ever question, are we in the family of God? We should never question because the Holy Spirit reveals to our hearts that we're a child of God. That we're a child of God. What does that do for your heart? That you know that you're a child of God. And there's millions that aren't around you in this world. That's not a child of God. They're not a child of God. God tells us clear in Romans 8 who belongs to him. We lay down the world. It's not burdensome to love him. It's not burdensome to lay down the world. It's not. The extravagant life that we're going to have when we get out of here. <laughs> the extravagant life that we have now when we surrender and we become desperate to know him with everything that we are. 
The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. I want to be righteous. We have it in our position because we, it was exchanged at the cross in 2 Corinthians 5.21. We, we exchanged our sin, our shame, our pain, our guilt, our old life for the life of Jesus. That's what we, we got. It was an exchange. The king of righteousness. He's the king of glory and he's the king of righteousness. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's our bridegroom. He's the judge. The judge of the living and the dead. He's the judge that we're going to stand before. We know this. It's all written down. It's how glorious it is. It says, how great is the love of the Father. I'm reading the first four verses. Has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world doesn't know us is that they did not know Him. We should look like the world. We should look different. We should just like mesh in with the world that people would know that we are that we are a child of God. That people would look to us and say, what is different about them? That we're not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God on the salvation. If we want our family members saved in Romans 1, 16 and 17, it says we are not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God on the salvation. Hallelujah. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. There's people that say, I'm saved. There's people that walk around and say, I'm a Christian. I, I go to church. I know this. I know that. But inside, inside, I've had a lot of people come to me and say, I don't know if He lives inside of me, Tracy. The Spirit of God that created all heaven and earth lives inside of us. We would know if we're born again. We would know by the Spirit of God that lives in us. We have the conviction of sin when we would be going out to do the sins in the world. We have the conviction of the Holy Spirit if He lived in there. See, we could still go and sin, but we, 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 we wouldn't enjoy it. <laughs> the Holy Spirit lives in us. We would not enjoy our sin. Day by day, night by night, week by week, month by month, He would be talking to us. He would give us a hunger and a thirst to search Him out, to seek Him out like Proverbs 2 says, that we seek Him out and we search Him out like treasure, like treasure. If you knew there was all the gold in the world or there was a gold mine in your backyard, you'd spend day and night digging and digging and digging and digging. You'd spend all your time looking for the gold and silver. And God says, that's how I want you to search me out. See, intimacy is found when we search Him out. When we seek Him with all of our heart, He will release the peace and the joy and the incompre incomprehensible love that we're all searching for in the wrong places. See, God's love is so tangible and so real and so powerful beyond our imagination and it just keeps pouring out and pouring out and pouring out and pouring out and that's our redemption story. We will have as much of God as we want. And God will not tolerate sin in your life. He will not tolerate it in my life. He will not. If we want the glory of God and we want to walk this Christian life out like God wants us to walk it out. So we rule and reign with Jesus someday that when we see him, we'll be like him. He says that, that if we truly believe this, we will purify ourselves. We will stand with Him. We won't be ashamed of Him. We will hate the sin that so easily ensnared us when we walked with the devil. The Bible says we either walk with the devil or we walk with God. And there's the line that's drawn in the sand. It just is what it is. I searched out the, I even searched out the Bible over and over and over and over and over, looking for the process looking for the place. And I'm not talking about the process of growing in God. I'm talking about the, 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 the um, I'm trying to look for the word, the thing that says it's okay for this right now because I just got saved. And, 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 and I have this in my life. And, and, and the, I can't think of the word I'm looking for, but there's a word that I'm looking for. And it's just when you, you make it all right in your mind that things are okay. 
But we have to know that Hebrews 4.13 says that God sees everything. He sees everything. Psalm 139, we love that. That, that um, Psalm, it says that when, he get, when we get up, He sees us. When we lay down, He sees us. When we get up, He hears us. When we lay down, He hears us. He sees us when we go in, when we come out, just like it says in Deuteronomy 6. But it says that He knows every hair on my head. He has seen me before I'm in my mother's womb. Do we believe this? I look around and I go, God, I don't know, like, purify my heart and every heart that's around me that I can see you, Lord God, in your glory and in your affections and in your personality. God, we love your glory. We love the power of God, but we want to know you and your affections and your personality for us. When you want to know how much God loves you and you search it out in the Bible like treasure, and you start, even in the Old Testament, it's so all over the New Testament. But there's a veil in our hearts that stays on our hearts until we can see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. When we've been totally undone by his sacrifice, when we've been totally undone by what he's done for us, we will see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Why did he die? He died and he shed his blood so we could be redeemed and restored back to the Father. The Bible says that his blood justified us. He paid the price. The Bible says that we no longer belong to ourselves, that we've been bought with a price by the precious blood of Jesus in 1, John, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that we have to live this life searching and seeking out the jewels about Jesus Christ. We have to lay our own agenda down to fall in love with him. To fall in love with him so we can encounter the glory that God wants to pour out on us. Verse 3. I don't think we're already, I don't even think we're up to verse 3 yet. The reason the world doesn't know us is that it didn't know him. I wanted to say eternal life is to know the one and only true God and his son Jesus Christ whom he sent. People don't know him, but the most important thing in our Bible is to know Jesus. That's eternal life. If we leave this life and we don't know him in intimacy, and that we don't know who he is, yes, we can escape the flames of fire according to 1 Corinthians 3 and get into heaven. But do we want to really leave this, live this life knowing what is the bare minimum we have to do to get in? What is the bare minimum? Do we, we already got the wrong heart. What is the maximum I can do every day for Jesus Christ? What is the maximum that we can do every day for Jesus Christ? We want to know him and we want to know that we know him. There's testimonies in this room from somebody that got radically saved here, that came to the altar and said, I want to be born again. I want to know that Jesus lives in me. They were in church for a long time, and they knew that after they heard a message that God was telling them that his spirit did not live in them. And they came up, and the redemption story happened right here on this rug. And they signed up for the school, and they accelerated in the word. They accelerated into the knowledge of who Jesus is. And I know, you know, there's a cost. I gotta pay for this place. I gotta pay for insurance. I put 30 to 40 hours a week in bringing that class on Sunday night. So I'm filled with power and presence. And if I could give the school free, I would. And maybe I just will after this message tonight. And see how many people sign up because they don't know the value of what they're gonna get for somebody that's sold out and in love with Jesus. I want people to know him. And if everything I have to do is free, so people will sign up and come, let it be. Let it be. Let it be. If I never get a dime to live this life following him, he's more valuable. And because I count the cost, because I counted the cost and I've lived for him, I want other people to live for him. But money will get in the way because other things in life are more valuable. 
sorry. Dear friends, now we are children of God and what we, what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. For we, we shall see him as he is. This is the banner back here. We're going to see him as he is. Isn't it exciting? We're going to stand before the King of Kings, our bridegroom. He's going to give us a place when we get out of here. I want to be close to Jesus. I don't want to be so far away because this life was more important. I'm going to live for him. I'm going to share him. I'm going to be rejected. People are going to come against me for the truth of God's word because it's important for people to know him intimately and passionately to live their life for him and not care if they're rejected. I buy fear in Jesus' name. I buy fear in Jesus' name. For God didn't give us a spirit of fear. He knew we'd all be fearful, that we wouldn't share the gospel. He knew that we would all care about our reputation. But the last revival was on Philippians 2, wasn't it? The last one, when we talked about the humility of Jesus, right, Gary? The last one, when we were on our knees, when we couldn't even take the humility, how Jesus said, for no reputation, I laid down my reputation as God and became man. That's what he did. So we could be spend eternity with him. I think the cross was enough. He didn't have to come in and live inside of me. But God wanted the Holy Spirit to live inside of every single person. Because way back in the book of Genesis, when he was in the garden and sin came, he knew there'd be only one way. And Jesus agreed from heaven to earth to come here and pay the debt for all of us. No one loves you like Jesus. I don't care how much your spouse, your children, your grandparents tell you they love you. No one loves you like Jesus, Karen. No one. Man doesn't matter. Man doesn't matter. You're sold out, my sister. And God sees your heart. There's a lot of people sold out in this room. That's why they're here tonight. Because <laughs> we love to come together. When two or three are gathered in his name, Jesus is in our midst. And you never know where you're going to get at the revival. Because I might have had everything planned up until the worship, and anybody that knows me knows like, this is just all right out of, except this verse. <laughs> so what banner should I put up? Maybe I should preach on it. <laughs> yeah, God's good. Verse 4. So when he appears, he said that we're going to be like him. He's going to fill us with glory. We're going to have such a glorious body. We're going to have, like, I get excited. Like, I talk to Jesus about the mandate. Like, oh God, I'm like, Jesus, I know I'm going to preach the gospel when I get to heaven. Because you know those people that just died right before they got there? See, everything will pass away, but the word of God lasts forever. So there's nothing more important than for you to know the word of God. Because maybe you'll get to be a messenger when you get there. Maybe your job will be sharing the word of God with the people in, in the new heaven and the new earth. Or maybe in the millennium when we got restored bodies and we all got our new body in the the second coming or when God comes to rapture us and then in the millennium when there's still human beings that live on this earth okay in the millennium and that's thousand years wouldn't it be awesome just like how Jesus did he was transported back and forth through the walls and he ate with his disciples in Luke 24 and that's what we're going to do and maybe he'll use us here in this room during the millennium of 1,000 years to come and be do whatever Jesus wants us to do. I get excited. I go, God, what am I going to do in the millennium? God, what am I going to do in the new heaven and the new earth where there's no sin and there's no unrighteousness? And in the new heaven and the new earth, what am I going to do? Are we waiting our whole life to see what we're going to do here? Or are we waiting our whole life to see what we're going to do there? It's a shift in your thinking. we got to have the mind of Christ. And if we don't know what the Bible says, we won't have his mind. But he's willing to give us his mind if we're ready to lay down our old thinking and get the kingdom mindsets that he wants us to bring. Hallelujah. Amen. Verse 4. i got to do this one more time. But we know that when he appears, let's say it. But we know when he appears, say it. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Hallelujah, God. 
We're waiting for your return, Lord. We're waiting, Lord. We want our family saved, Lord. We want the redemption story in our family. We thank you, Jesus. Verse 4, everyone who has this hope, look what this says, verse 4, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. See, purity and holiness and godliness and, and the beauty of Jesus is true pleasure. False pleasures is everything the world has to offer. It's short, it leads you to the road of destruction, and the enemy has kept you down and out of understanding. That's, that's what he's done. If we come in agreement with Satan, and agree, if we do not know God's word, and our mouth speaks what we come in agreement with, we will have. This is what the Bible says, the power of life and death is in our own tongue. We have to know the word and call things forth, like it says in Romans 4, 17. We call things forth that are not, like our children, our grandchildren, our siblings, our parents, our grandparents, those ones that aren't saved. We all should be fasting and praying like that woman one day a week on our knees in our prayer closets. Amen. Hallelujah. For our sake, it's not going to haphazardly happen. If we don't get serious about prayer, if we want our children to live a different life, let's get on our knees, pray and fast. Is it worth it? Or, or haphazardly, are we just going to say, well, we believe it. This woman for eight years, eight years, eight years, she prayed and fasted every week and every single day in the morning for three hours, she was in her prayer closet. That's taken me to a new level. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We'll pray for you, sister. So, um, when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. There's freedom. There's freedom, freedom in knowing who you are in Christ. If you don't know who you are in Christ, you will be in bondage to the things in this world. You have to know your identity. That's Christianity 101. And if you don't know who you are and who he is in you and who you are in him, it's going to be a hard walk. And God wants to reveal himself to you in your prayer closet. Shut the door and go behind. Shut down the electronics. Shut the door. Go behind the door and tell Jesus that you want to know him. Amen. Go to first, um, Second Corinthians chapter three. Hallelujah! Do we love him tonight? Amen. Amen. Okay, now I'm getting into my message, so get ready. <laughs> Isn't it funny? It's twenty of eight. And here I am. Okay, to the message now. Uh, that all just like flew out of my spirit. Flew, like it was like a raging. <laughs> Water. <laughs> I can't even explain it. He's so good. Hi, Deb. Okay. I'm really excited that y'all came out tonight. This is in condemnation. This none of this is this is beautiful what I'm talking about. This is beautiful. This is the beauty of the Lord. If I would have been, went through all that torture and got up there on that cross, I wouldn't want to have anything to do with any of you. <laughs> but God, he wants to come in and live in us by his spirit. So Jesus died on the cross. We're going to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. But Jesus died on the cross. Why? Because we all needed the Holy Spirit. See, the whole Old Testament talks about the Holy Spirit coming on upon people and getting off of them. Those people in the Old Testament, my husband loves to read the Old Testament. He's always saying, Tracy, come in the room. I got to read you this verse, and I got to tell you this and tell you that. Because he's in awe about the people in the Old Testament, what they had to go through, how they had to endure, and none of them had the Holy Spirit. To understand that we have the power of God to be empowered to do this Christian life. The grace of God is that he broke the power of sin. In our lives he broke the power of sin that man that was in prison see he had a true redemption story see God broke the power of sin in his life 
See, one drop of blood, when he saw the goodness and kindness of Jesus, when God ripped the veil off his heart and off his mind, and he could see Jesus, when he could see Jesus, when he could see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, which is 2 Corinthians 4, 6. We're not going to get there. But that was an eye-opening for me. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. He said the eyes, 3 and 4, says the mind that Satan, of, the God of this age, Satan of this world, keeps the unbelievers blinded, their minds blinded, so that they can't see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So we as Christians ourselves have to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That if he isn't a big part of your life, that you, you, you feel like you're not empowered to talk about him to somebody, you haven't seen the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Fear and rejection is keeping the church down. So we just bind the spirit of fear again, and we break those shackles off. Maybe it'll be an impartation of boldness that's happening during this message. I have no idea. But God told me yesterday there was an impartation happening here tonight in this meeting. So the Holy Spirit came. Why? Jesus had to shed his blood. He died. He rose again. He walked on this earth for 40 days to tell the disciples and all the people that were with him what the most important thing on earth was to bring the kingdom of God here. What does the Bible say in Romans 14, 17? In Luke 17, 21, he says that the, that the kingdom of God is not here and not there. It says the kingdom of God is within or in you or in your midst. See, Jesus brought the kingdom of God here on this earth, teaching about the kingdom of God. And the Holy Spirit was released for every believer on the earth to receive him, receive the redemption, be justified, sanctified, and then glorified from glory to glory on this earth till we have total glorification when we see him face to face. That's what happened. So we need the Holy Spirit. If we don't have the Holy Spirit, and you happen to be in a church, like I don't know, I have the people in this room, so I don't know what kind of church that you go to or what you're into, but the thing that we need is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our teacher. It says it in John 14, 26, John 15, 26, and John 16, 13, and 14 says he's the spirit of truth. So when the Holy Spirit talks to you, if you hear something that's not right, the Holy Spirit will talk to you. He is your teacher. Now, he's teaching you tonight through me. You might have a minute. A minister is, we're, we're, we're equipping the saints to go out. It says in 2 Corinthians, sorry. It says it in Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, it's the apostle, prophet, the evangelist, the teacher, and the pastor to equip the saints to come together in a unity and to equip the saints in the knowledge of God, to the, in the knowledge of Him. I'm here teaching you about Jesus tonight. I'm here teaching you about the love of the Father. I'm here teaching you about the Holy Spirit. Because any other conversation in the Bible about anything else is not what God needs you to hear. He needs you to hear about Jesus and His Son to your transformed, so you're up off the seats and sharing the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Jesus is the one that sets you free. I had a powerful encounter, there's people in the room that don't know, with God, but I had a choice. I could have ran to him or just took the encounter. See, every encounter that we have, every single encounter that we have, every single encounter that we have, we have for a reason. Not for us just to encounter God in a powerful way. But when we encounter God through the scriptures or there's an impartation, somebody prayed for you and your eyes became open or open in the scripture or somebody prayed and, and there was an, a spiritual gift that was imparted into you, it's not just for you. It's for everybody around you. We can't be lakes. We have to be rivers. We have to be, we have to know that every single day, I think I put this on my Facebook, I have just been really bold on Facebook lately. But the most important thing for us to know is this is the number one. What do we believe in this room about what we think God thinks about us? And a lot of times it's warped. Everybody's like, oh, God doesn't love me. I did this. Were we redeemed or not? Do we have a redemption story? Did the blood of Jesus cover our sin? Even when we fall out, 
repent, push delete, and keep going. Because if God forgives all our sins, we have to stop going back. That's not kingdom mindsets, bringing up the past. Just repent. The, the redemption story is beautiful. Redemption is beautiful. We can't look at anybody the same that's been redeemed. Everybody has different sin in their life that they participated in. But when we're truly redeemed as Christians, the, the Bible says in Colossians 2, we can no longer look at Christ and look at people in this world once they've been redeemed and not think about them in their old sin. Because then you don't have a kingdom mindset. Then you don't know who God really is for you. We can't say this person, that person. I truly believe when somebody gets born again and Jesus by his spirit comes to live in them and they fell out in sin and they repented and renounced their old sin and hated their old sin, they're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. What about the Apostle Paul? He was killing the first Christians. And God used him for the most powerful instrument, he said, to advance the kingdom of God on earth. But Peter and, and a bunch of the brothers, they had a problem with Paul. They had a problem with him. And Paul rebuked them openly. Peter and John and all the people, that he rebuked them openly. Do we believe the gospel or not? Amen. So the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is a person. I want you to know he's a real person that reveals himself to every lover of Jesus. You know, Jesus, the Holy Spirit came. He was poured out. I was thinking about this the other day. He was poured out and the Holy Spirit does all these miracles and he, he releases the power of God in our lives. But the Holy Spirit is the most humble person I realized. He wasn't saying, it's me, it's me, it's me. Because in John 14 and in John 15, he came to testify about Jesus. He came to reveal Jesus to us. One time he didn't say, wait a minute. He's revealing Jesus to us. The Holy Spirit, three in one, it's a mystery. But the Holy Spirit wasn't looking to be glorified. He was here to reveal Jesus to each one of us. So we would fall in love with Jesus. We would see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we would start realizing in our life, the most important thing is what we believe that God thinks about us. And what do we believe who God really is? That will change your life. That will change your life if you really believe the gospel. In Mark, in Mark chapter 1, it says, repent and believe the gospel. That's a tall order. One, nobody wants to read the word. I didn't say nobody. I don't mean it like that. But that's like last. Everything else will pass away and the word of God will last forever. Why would that not be the most important thing? And if the Holy Spirit isn't talking to you, when you're opening up the scriptures, I love my husband when he says that every single time he opens the word of God, even my daughter when they said it took a year for the Holy Spirit to reveal himself to her. She said, but I would look over the banister, just like my husband, would look over and just see me spending hour after hour after hour after hour after hour after hour in the presence of God reading the word. She kept on saying, there's something mom's seeing, there's something mom's seeing, but it's pretty darn boring to me. Because there's a veil on all of our hearts. And God is jealous for us. And if we put everything else before him, you won't see the beauty realm of God. You won't encounter the glory of God. You won't know him in truth. You won't know what he has to give you that stronger. His love is stronger than death. His love is greater than any other love. It's the love of God. The agape love of God that's greater and more magnificent than anything that we can even imagine. Paul was on his knees. He was praying. Ephesians 1 and 3. One, it was that, that we would just know Jesus. He said, if we would just have the spirit and wisdom, the spirit of wisdom and revelation of the knowledge of Him. If we would just have the spirit of wisdom and revelation of the knowledge of Him. He was on His knees saying, God, pour out your light and your revelation 
into their hearts so that they can see you. The apostle Paul knew when the veil got torn away from him, he looked around, he saw people can't see him. There's religious people, there's people going to church, there's people that can say the Christian ease, but their life doesn't look like it. And Jesus sees everything. This is a good message today because it's all about his love and his beauty and the glory of God being poured out, not only in power, not only in wisdom, which I talked about last month, but this is the glory of God, of his emotions, of his affections. That's what he wants to pour out, his emotions, his affections. He wants you to know when Moses was on that hill and he was up there with God, you know, can you imagine the veil that he had to wear before everybody in the crowd because he was so radiant, just like it says in Psalm 34, those that are fixed and gazed to the Lord, they'll have a radiance upon them. He never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Lord never changes, and you can have as much radiance as you want, because when I look at you, Lindsay, I see Jesus. I see Jesus. I see the glory of God shining off of your face. That's what I see, the glory of God pouring out when you open up your mouth. You're not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God on the salvation, and you're into truth. Moses was on this hill, and he was standing with the Lord 40 days. He didn't eat. He didn't drink. He had nothing. But see, the Lord was enough for him. He was up there, and he wrote down the, the, the tablets and came back down, and he had so much glory on him. And it was fading away because God was preparing the people for the new covenant where the glory never stops. We will have as much glory, Mike, as we want we will have as much of God's glory, his personality, his affections as we want. But he's jealous for you, Mike. He's jealous for you. Other people don't matter. But God's love pours in our hearts that we love everybody around us. But it's his affection. We might seek power. We might seek wisdom. But when you seek intimacy, that's when his glory pours out. That's when his glory pours out. I, I want to at least read 2 Corinthians 3. <laughs> Hold on. Whew. It's warm in here. I love you guys. Yeah, I'm probably on camera laughing. Okay, verse 12. Um, I'm in 2 Corinthians 3. I'm going to just read it through, and then we'll end in prayer. I, I can pick, and I can quote, and I can do this, but I just want you to get this tonight. Verse 7, this is the glory of the new covenant. And remember, I told you in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, you always want to come with a pad or a pen or record me like Wheezy usually does every time. Uh, the glory of God... He's so kind. I just want you to know, he's not a taskmaster. This life isn't hard with Christ. Yeah, we might be murder, uh, martyred at the stake. But when I read in Revelation about all that are martyred, I'm saying, hey God, I'll be a martyr. I see what's happening for them in the next life. we got to live from a heavenly perspective. What an honor to die in Jesus' name. What an honor to die in Jesus' name. Wow. Verse 7, Now if the ministry that brought death, you understand that? That's the law. That brought death, which was engraved in letters of stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory fading, though it was. So Moses had the glory, but it was fading. This was the law. See, they couldn't, they, they couldn't, they couldn't do it. Church, they couldn't do it. They did have the Holy Spirit to empower them. This is, this is with the age that we're living in right now, what God shows you at this time and at this place and in, the, in this country. This is beyond my comprehension. 
None of these people had the Holy Spirit. They had to try to do it themselves. And that's why Jesus had to shed his blood. So we could have the Holy Spirit. So we could live this incredible, intimate, powerful, passionate, incredible life of glory with the King of glory. And then the rest of our eternal life, you got to get in the Bible and see what God has prepared for us. For those who love him. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. I'm getting ready at the face of Moses because it's his glory. Fading though it was, will not. The ministry of the Spirit even more glorious. I'm going to start over. Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters of stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit even be more glorious? Praise God. Amen. If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? Do you remember? The king of righteousness for our sin, pain, shame, all of it. Amen. For what was glorious has no glory. Now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if that was fading away, came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing as it, it while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull. We don't want a dull life. We want an exciting, exuberant life in Christ. He will reveal his glory. Let your glory fall right now upon each one. Let the joy of the Lord fall right now in Jesus' name. For to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It, is not, it has not been removed because only in Christ as it is taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But when anyone turns, listen closely, but when anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. They're right here when they're talking about the Lord, they're talking about the Holy Spirit. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, who with unveiled faces, He means that we can see Him. See, if we still have a veil over our face, then we can't see Jesus. We can't see him, that the glory of God is revealing Christ to us through the Holy Spirit. If we can't see him in the measure that he wants us to see, get hungry and thirsty. Because it says in uh, Matthew 5, the hunger and the thirst, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be satisfied. They shall be filled you have to be hungry and thirsty. And if you want to live a mediocre life, that's what you will have. A mediocre Christian life. But get excited for the day to come. It says, and, with, and we who with all unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into the likeness with the ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. This glory that was poured out in, in Exodus to Moses when God said, when, when Moses said, God, show me your glory, he didn't pour out power and wisdom. Listen closely. He didn't pour out power and wisdom. When he said, show me your glory, he poured out his personality, his affections, his name, which is glory. I am the Lord, the Lord. He said it twice. He said, I am, I am mercy, I am forgiveness, I am everlasting love, I'm faithful. This is God's glory. This is his personality. He said, I will pour out my glory, my goodness. Is there anybody, God saying, that wants to know me intimately, that wants my glory John 17, like I said earlier, pour out the glory of God on the believers and the disciples. Jesus said, I want them with me where I am. He was getting ready to go to the cross. He knew where he was going. 
He was so concerned about us. This is the random kindness of him. He was so concerned about us that we would have his glory and power and the Holy Spirit and that we would know him and we would know the Father because he brought the Father. He was the one that revealed the Father and now we reveal the Father, the Father's heart to everyone around us. So Lord, I just pray in the mighty name of Jesus right now, before we have an altar call for an impartation or healing or salvation or anything that you want, I, I ask you, Lord, that you would just pour out, pour out right now the spirit of wisdom and revelation of the knowledge of you, Jesus. That we would be shaken to the core, that you, your love would be this radical. We would be shaken to the core about this radical love. That we would love you back with the kind of love that you love us. We can sing about it, God. But we want it to be a reality in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. As Tracy was preaching this evening, I was sitting back there, my, I was just being stirred in my spirit. As she said earlier, I, I love reading the Old Testament, and I was in the book of Jeremiah today. And the testimony that Tracy shared about the, the woman praying for eight years for her son, and Becky and Paul back here who prayed for their son for years and years. And I just want to share the beauty of Jesus Christ, because in the book of Jeremiah, God gets to the point where he says to Jeremiah, do not pray anymore for the Israelites. Do not wail and do not lament for them. I am done with them. But Jesus Christ came and died for us. And God will never tell anyone in here to stop praying for anyone. There's no one that God will cast off because the word says, I want all to come to repentance. I wish that everyone would be saved. So ladies and gentlemen, never give up praying for anyone. And in, in the book of Jeremiah, it says that the Lord, Jeremiah prays that he would circumcise our hearts. So I pray tonight, Lord, that you circumcise our hearts. Cut away everything that is dead. There's something in each one of us that needs to die, so crucify that tonight, Jesus. Lord God. Jesus. Take it from us. Burn it up, Lord God. Circumcise our hearts. Soften our hearts. You wish that all would come to repentance, Lord, so tonight... Burn it off of us and cut it away. And let us all come to you with a pure heart, for you will never cast any of us away. So, Lord God, I lift everyone up in this room tonight, Lord God. You love each one of us with an everlasting love, Lord God. And we just worship you and glorify you. And we thank you that you will never cast any of us away. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Thank you, Lord.